Hello students, welcome to 25 Henclex practice questions, answers and rationale on all category. Volume 2. Number 1. A 24-year-old female is admitted to the emergency room due to confusion. This patient has a history of a myeloma diagnosis, constipation, intense abdominal pain, and polyuria. Based on the presenting signs and symptoms, which of the following would you most likely suspect? A. Diverticulosis B. Hypercalcemia C. Hypocalcemia D. Irritable Bowel Syndrome Correct answer, B. Hypercalcemia Rationale Hypercalcemia can cause polyuria, severe abdominal pain, and confusion. Option A. Diverticulosis is a condition that develops when pouches, diverticula, form in the wall of the large intestine, most people don't have symptoms. Option C. Hypocalcemia is low calcium levels in the blood, it is asymptomatic in mild forms, but can cause paresthesia, tetany, muscle cramps, and carpopedal spasms in severe hypocalcemia. Option D. Irritable bowel syndrome is a widespread condition involving recurrent abdominal pain and diarrhea or constipation, often associated with stress, depression, anxiety, or previous intestinal infection. Number 2. While planning care for a toddler, the nurse teaches the parents about the expected developmental changes for this age. Which statement by the mother shows that she understands the child's developmental needs? A. I want to protect my child from any falls. B. I will set limits on exploring the house. C. I understand the need to use those new skills. D. I intend to keep control over our child. Correct answer. C. I understand the need to use those new skills. Rationale. Erickson describes the stage of the toddler as being the time when there is normally an increase in autonomy. The child needs to use motor skills to explore the environment and develop autonomy. Option A. The statement in option A is correct but pertains to the risks associated with a toddler. Option B. Setting limits on a toddler may cause frustration instead of independence. Option D. Controlling the child may be harmful to her development as toddlers should be developing their autonomy at this stage. Number 3. The nurse is preparing to administer an enteral feeding to a client via a nasogastric feeding tube. The most important action of the nurse is a. Verify correct placement of the tube. b. Check that the feeding solution matches the dietary order. c. Aspirate abdominal contents to determine the amount of last feeding remaining in stomach. D. Ensure that feeding solution is at room temperature. Correct answer. A. Verify correct placement of the tube. Rationale. Proper placement of the tube prevents aspiration and entrance of food content into the lungs. The definitive way to ascertain the position of the nasogastric tube is through visualization by an x-ray. Another method is to aspirate stomach contents and check its pH, usually pH 1 to 5. Aspirated stomach content can also be tested for bilirubin to confirm it is placed in the stomach. Option B. It is also important to check that the feeding solution matches the dietary order to ensure that the client gets proper nutrition. Option C. Aspirating the gastric contents is one of the methods used to determine the last feeding amount in the stomach, but is not the most important action the nurse should do. Option D. Keep it at room temperature so it would not upset the stomach. Number 4. The nurse is caring for a client with a serum potassium level of 3.5 milliequivalents per litre. The client is placed on a cardiac monitor and receives 40 milliequivalents potassium chloride in 1000 ml of 5% dextrose in water IV. Which of the following EKG patterns indicates to the nurse that the infusions should be discontinued? A. Narrowed QIS complex. B. Shortened PR interval. C. 
Tall peaked T waves. D. Prominent U waves. Correct answer. C. Tall peaked T waves. Rationale. A tall peaked T wave is a sign of hyperkalemia. The healthcare provider should be notified regarding discontinuing the medication. Option A. Narrow QIS complex indicates fast cardiac rhythms, generally more than 100 beats a minute, with a QIS duration of 100 milliseconds or less. Option B. A short PR interval, less than 120 milliseconds, is seen with pre-excitation syndromes and AV nodal, junctional, rhythm. Option D. Prominent U waves are characteristic of hypokalemia. Number 5. The nurse anticipates that for a family who practices Chinese medicine the priority goal would be to a. Achieve harmony. b. Maintain a balance of energy. c. Respect life. d. Restore yin and yang. Correct answer, d. Restore yin and yang. Rationale. For followers of Chinese medicine, Health is maintained through the balance between the forces of yin and yang. Traditional Chinese medicine is a medical system that began being developed in China about 5,000 years ago, which makes it the oldest continuous medical system on the planet. Option A. Living in harmony with one's natural environment with the aim of keeping all aspects of a person's mind, body, and spirit in a state of harmony and balance so that disease never has a chance to develop. Option B. This balance and a healthy lifestyle are the focus of Chinese medicine which empowers the individual to participate in his own health. Option C. In Chinese medicine, the body, and indeed a human being, is not seen as a machine, living in isolation from the world around it. Human beings are seen as part of the whole of things, which includes our environments, nature, and the universe itself. Number 6. During an assessment of a client with cardiomyopathy, the nurse finds that the systolic blood pressure has decreased from 145 to 110 mm of mercury, and the heart rate has risen from 72 to 96 beats per minute, and the client complains of periodic dizzy spells. The nurse instructs the client to a. Increase fluids that are high in protein. b. Restrict fluids. c. Force fluids and reassess blood pressure. D. Limit fluids to non-caffeine beverages. Correct answer. C. Force fluids and reassess blood pressure. Rationale. Orthostatic hypertension, a decrease in systolic blood pressure of more than 15 mm of mercury, and an increase in heart rate of more than 15% usually accompanied by dizziness indicate volume depletion inadequate vasoconstrictor mechanisms, and autonomic insufficiency. Option A. Fluids may not be necessarily protein-rich. Option B. Restricting fluids could aggravate the client's dizziness. Option D. There is no need to restrict the fluid intake of the client. Number 7. The nurse prepares the client for the insertion of a pulmonary artery catheter, Swan-Gans catheter. The nurse teaches the client that the catheter will be inserted to provide information about a. Stroke volume b. Cardiac output c. Venous pressure d. Left ventricular functioning Correct answer, d. Left ventricular functioning Rationale The catheter is placed in the pulmonary artery. Information regarding left ventricular function is obtained when the catheter balloon is inflated. Option A. Stroke volume is calculated using measurements of ventricle volumes from an echocardiogram and subtracting the volume of the blood in the ventricle at the end of a beat, called end-systolic volume, from the volume of blood just prior to the beat, called end-diastolic volume. Option B. Cardiac output is calculated by multiplying the stroke volume by the heart rate. Option C. The CVP can be measured either manually using a manometer or electronically using a transducer. Number 8. 
A nurse enters a client's room to discover that the client has no pulse or respirations. After calling for help, the first action the nurse should take is A. Start a peripheral IV. B. Initiate high-quality chest compressions. C. Establish an airway. D. Obtain the crash cart. Correct answer, B. Initiate high-quality chest compressions. Rationale. As per new guidelines, the American Heart Association recommends beginning CPR with chest compression rather than checking for the airway first. Start CPR with 30 chest compressions before checking the airway and giving rescue breaths. Starting with chest compressions first applies to adults, children, and infants needing CPR, but not newborns. CPR can keep oxygenated blood flowing to the brain and other vital organs until more definitive medical treatment can restore a normal heart rhythm. Option A, starting a peripheral IV can come after the CAB sequence. Option C, establishing an airway comes after compressions. Option D, after performing the guidelines by the AHA, the crash cart can be obtained by another nurse responding to the scene. Number 9. A client is receiving digoxin, lenoxin, 0.25 mg daily. The healthcare provider has written a new order to give metoprolol, low pressor, 25 mg BID. In assessing the client prior to administering the medications, which of the following should the nurse report immediately to the health care provider? A. Blood pressure 94 over 60 mm of mercury. B. Heart rate 76 beats per minute. C. Urine output 50 ml per hour. D. Respiratory rate 16 beats per minute. Correct answer, A, blood pressure 94 over 60 mm of mercury. Rationale. Both medications decrease the heart rate. Metoprolol affects blood pressure. Therefore, the heart rate and blood pressure must be within the normal range, HR 60 to 100, systolic blood pressure over 100, in order to safely administer both medications. Option B. A heart rate of 76 is within the normal range. Option C, increase in urine output is the desired effect of diuretics, which is given with digoxin. Option D, a respiratory rate of 16 is within the normal range. Number 10. The nurse practicing in a maternity setting recognizes that the post-mature fetus is at risk due to A. Excessive fetal weight B. Low blood sugar levels. C. Depletion of subcutaneous fat. D. Progressive placental insufficiency. Correct answer, D. Progressive placental insufficiency. Rationale. Post-mature or post-term pregnancy is a prolonged pregnancy that exceeds the limits of 38 to 42 weeks normal term pregnancy. Infants of such pregnancy are considered post-mature or dismature if there is evidence that placental insufficiency has occurred and interfered with fetal growth. It occurs in 12% of all pregnancies. The placenta loses its adequacy to function after 42 weeks, after which it acquires calcium deposits which decrease the blood perfusion, supply of oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. Options A, B and C excessive fetal weight, hypoglycemia, and depletion of subcutaneous fat are all observed in a post-mature fetus. Number 11. The nurse is caring for a client who had a total hip replacement seven days ago. Which statement by the client requires the nurse's immediate attention? A. I have bad muscle spasms in my lower leg of the affected extremity. B. I just can't catch my breath over the past few minutes and I think I am in grave danger. C. I have to use the bedpan to pass my water at least every one to two hours. D. It seems that the pain medication is not working as well today. Correct answer, B. 
I just can't catch my breath over the past few minutes and I think I am in grave danger. Rationale The nurse would be concerned about all of these comments, however, the most life-threatening is option B. Clients who had hip or knee surgery are at higher risk for the development of postoperative pulmonary embolism. Sudden dyspnea and tachycardia are classic findings of pulmonary embolism. Without prophylaxis, e. g. anticoagulation medications, deep vein thrombosis can develop within 7 to 14 days following the surgery and can lead to pulmonary embolism. The nurse should be aware of the other signs of DVT, which include pain and tenderness at or below the area of the clot, skin discoloration, swelling, or tightness of the affected leg. Signs of pulmonary embolism include acute onset of dyspnea, tachycardia, confusion, and pleuritic chest pain. Option A, muscle spasms occur after total hip replacements and acute pain is expected after a surgical procedure. Option C, may indicate urinary infection and needs further assessment by the nurse. Option D, may require a re-evaluation of pain and interventions to manage pain though does not need immediate action. Number 12. A 33-year-old male client with heart failure has been taking furosemide for the past week. Which of the following assessment cues below may indicate the client is experiencing a negative side effect from the medication? A. Weight gain of 5 pounds. B. Edema of the ankles. C. Gastric irritability. D. Decreased appetite. Correct answer, D. Decreased appetite. Rationale. Furosemide is a loop diuretic that is used for pulmonary edema, edema in heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, and hypertension. Furosemide causes a loss of potassium unless a supplement or a potassium-rich diet is taken. A decrease in appetite is caused by hypokalemia. Signs and symptoms of hypokalemia include anorexia, fatigue, nausea, decreased GI motility, muscle weakness, dysrhythmias, reduced urine osmolality, altered level of consciousness. Option A. Weight gain is not a negative side effect of furosemide. Option B. Edema of the ankles are indications for the administration of furosemide. Option C. Gastric irritability is not a side effect of furosemide. Number 13. The nurse is caring for a 27-year-old female client with venous stasis ulcer. Which nursing intervention would be most effective in promoting healing? A. Apply dressing using sterile technique. B. Improve the client's nutrition status. C. Initiate limb compression therapy. D. Begin proteolytic debridement. Correct answer, B. Improve the client's nutrition status. Rationale. Venous stasis occurs when venous blood collects and stagnates in the lower leg due to incompetent venous valves. Eventually, Little oxygen and nutrients are supplied to the cells of the lower extremities causing the cells to die or necrose. This ultimately leads to the formation of venous stasis ulcers characterized by shallow but large brown wounds with irregular margins that typically develop on the lower leg or ankle. The goal of clinical management in a client with venous stasis ulcers is to promote healing. This only can be accomplished with proper nutrition. Nutritional deficiencies are common causes of venous ulcers. Alterations in the diet to include foods high in protein, iron, zinc, and vitamins C and A are encouraged to promote wound healing. Option A. Dressings are often used under compression bandages to promote faster healing and prevent adherence of the bandage to the ulcer. A wide range of dressings are available, including hydrocolloids, E. G. Duoderm, foams, hydrogels, pastes, and simple non-adherent dressings. Option C. Compression therapy is the standard of care for venous ulcers and chronic venous insufficiency. A recent Cochrane review found that venous ulcers heal more quickly with compression therapy than without. Methods include inelastic, elastic, and intermittent pneumatic compression. 
Compression therapy reduces edema, improves venous reflux, enhances healing of ulcers, and reduces pain. Option D, removal of necrotic tissue and bacterial burden through debridement has long been used in wound care to enhance healing. Debridement may be sharp, e. g, using a curette or scissors, enzymatic, mechanical, biologic, that is using larvae, or autolytic. Number 14. Which of these statements best describes the characteristics of an effective reward feedback system? A. Specific feedback is given as close to the event as possible. B. Staff is given feedback in equal amounts over time. C. Positive statements are to precede a negative statement. D. Performance goals should be higher than what is attainable. Correct answer. A. Specific feedback is given as close to the event as possible. Rationale. Feedback is most useful when given immediately. Positive behavior is strengthened through immediate feedback, and it is easier to modify problem behaviors if the standards are clearly understood. Option B. Positive feedback is most useful when given immediately. Option C. Negative statements are never helpful in any given situation. Option D. Every goal should always be attainable. Number 15. The nurse is providing information to a client with multiple sclerosis on performing exercises and physical activities. The nurse determines the client needs additional teaching if the client makes which statements. Select all that apply. A. I can lift weights and do resistance training. B. I should exercise to the point of exhaustion. C. I can include aerobic exercises in my routine. D. Proper stretching should be done before starting my routine. E. I should exercise continuously without rest. Correct answers, B and E. Rationale. Option B. Patients with multiple sclerosis should not exercise to the point of fatigue as strenuous physical exercise raises body temperature and may aggravate symptoms. Option E. Continuous exercise with no rest periods is contraindicated for patients with multiple sclerosis who wants to exercise. The patient should be advised to take short rest periods, preferably lying down. Again, extreme fatigue may contribute to the exacerbation of symptoms. Option A. Exercises should include activities that would strengthen weak muscles because diminishing muscle strength is often a primary concern in multiple sclerosis. These activities include lifting weights and resistance exercises. Option C. Aerobic exercises help promote muscle efficiency, increase flexibility, improves mood, and helps eliminate stress. Option D. Muscle stretching should be included prior to exercise as this helps minimize muscle spasticity and contractures, which is common in later stages of multiple sclerosis. Number 16. During the evaluation of the quality of home care for a client with Alzheimer's disease, the priority for the nurse is to reinforce which statement by a family member. A. At least two full meals a day are eaten. B. We go to a group discussion every week at our community center. C. We have safety bars installed in the bathroom and have 24-hour alarms on the doors. D. The medication is not a problem to have it taken three times a day. Correct answer. C. We have safety bars installed in the bathroom and have 24-hour alarms on the doors. Rationale. Note all options are correct statements. However, safety is most important to reinforce. Option C. Ensuring safety of the client with increasing memory loss is a priority of home care. In addition to installation of safety bars, all obvious hazards should be removed in order to prevent falls and other injuries. A hazard-free home environment allows the patient maximum independence and a sense of autonomy. Option A, in addition to proper nutrition, mealtimes should be kept pleasant, simple, calm, and without confrontations. 
Patients with AD prefer foods that are familiar, appetizing, and tastes good. Food should be cut into smaller pieces when possible to prevent choking. Hot food and beverages should be served warm or have their temperature checked to prevent burns. Option B. Socialization is encouraged for patients with dementia. Participation in simple activities, visits from friends, doing hobbies, or caring for pets helps improve the quality of life. Option D. Medication for Alzheimer's disease helps manage the cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Number 17. A nurse is reviewing a patient's medication during shift change. Which of the following medications would be contraindicated if the patient were pregnant? Select all that apply. A. Warfarin, Coumadin. B. Finasteride, Propecia, Proscar. C. Celecoxib, Celebrex. D. Clonidine, Catapress. E. Transdermal nicotine, Habitrol. F. Clofazamine, Lamprine. Correct answer, A. Warfarin, Coumadin, B. Finasteride, Propecia, Proscar. Rationale. Option A, Warfarin, Coumadin has a pregnancy category X and associated with central nervous system defects, spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, prematurity, hemorrhage, and ocular defects when given anytime during pregnancy and fetal warfarin syndrome when given during the first trimester. Option B, finasteride, Propecia, Proscar. Also has a pregnancy category X, which has a high risk of causing permanent damage to the fetus. Option C, Celecoxib, Celebrex. Large doses cause birth defects in rabbits, pregnancy category C. Option D, Clonidine, Catapress. Crosses the placenta, but no adverse fetal effects have been observed. Option E, Transdermal Nicotine, Habitrol. Nicotine replacement products have been assigned to pregnancy category C, Nicotine Gum, and category D, Transdermal Patches, Inhalers and spray nicotine products. Option F, Clofazamine, Lamprine. Clofazamine has been assigned to pregnancy category C. Number 18. A nurse is reviewing a patient's past medical history, PMH. The history indicates the patient has photosensitive reactions to medications. Which of the following drugs is associated with photosensitive reactions? Select all that apply. A. Ciprofloxacin, Cipro. B. Sulfonamide. C. Norfloxacin, Noraxin. D. Sulfamethoxazole and Trimethoprim, Bactrim. E. Isotretinoin, Accutane. F. Nitrodur patch. Correct answer A, B, C, D, and E. Rationale. Photosensitivity is an extreme sensitivity to ultraviolet rays from the sun and other light sources. A type of photosensitivity called phototoxic reactions are caused when medications in the body interact with ultraviolet rays from the sun. Anti-infectives are the most common cause of this type of reaction. Option A. Ciprofloxacin is used to treat a variety of bacterial infections. Ciprofloxacin belongs to a class of drugs called quinolone antibiotics. It works by stopping the growth of bacteria. This antibiotic treats only bacterial infections. It will not work for virus infections, such as common cold, flu. Unnecessary use or overuse of any antibiotic can lead to its decreased effectiveness. Option B. Sulfonamides are synthetic bacteriostatic antibiotics that competitively inhibit conversion of p-aminobenzoic acid to dihydropterote, which bacteria need for folate synthesis and ultimately purine and DNA synthesis. Humans do not synthesize folate, but acquire it in their diet, so their DNA synthesis is less affected. Option C. Norfloxacin is an antibiotic in a group of drugs called fluoroquinolones. Norfloxacin fights bacteria in the body. Norfloxacin is used to treat different bacterial infections of the prostate or urinary tract 
bladder, and kidneys. Norfloxacin is also used to treat gonorrhea. Option D, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim combination is used to treat infections such as urinary tract infections, middle ear infections, otitis media, bronchitis, traveler's diarrhea, and shigellosis, bacillary dysentery. This medicine is also used to prevent or treat pneumocystis gyrovecha pneumonia or pneumocystis carinia pneumonia, PCP, a very serious kind of pneumonia. Sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim combination is an antibiotic. It works by eliminating the bacteria that cause many kinds of infections. Option E, isotretinoin is a drug used to treat severe acne that hasn't responded to other treatments. It may be prescribed for other uses, including other skin problems and certain kinds of cancer. This drug is a vitamin A derivative, retinoid, so your body reacts to it in a similar way that it does to vitamin A. Option F, nitrodur patch is used to prevent chest pain or angina. Its side effects are headache, lightheadedness, nausea, and flushing. Number 19. A patient tells you that her urine is starting to look discolored. If you believe this change is due to medication, which of the following of the patient's medication does not cause urine discoloration? A. Sulfasalazine B. Levodopa C. Phenolphthalein D. Aspirin Correct answer, D. Aspirin Rationale. Aspirin is not known to cause discoloration of the urine. Side effects and complications of taking aspirin include stroke caused by a burst blood vessel. The Food and Drug Administration doesn't recommend aspirin therapy for the prevention of heart attacks in people who haven't already had a heart attack, stroke or another cardiovascular condition. Option A. Sulfasalazine may discolor the urine or skin to orange-yellow color. Sulfasalazine is used to treat ulcerative colitis and to decrease the frequency of ulcerative colitis attacks. Sulfasalazine will not cure ulcerative colitis, but it can reduce the number of attacks you have. Option B, levodopa may discolor the urine, saliva, or sweat to a dark brown color. Levodopa is in a class of medications called central nervous system agents. It works by being converted to dopamine in the brain. Carbidopa is in a class of medications called decarboxylase inhibitors. It works by preventing levodopa from being broken down before it reaches the brain. Option C. Phenolphthalein can discolor the urine to a red color. Phenolphthalein is often used as an indicator in acid-base titrations. For this application, it turns colorless in acidic solutions and pink in basic solutions. Number 20. You are responsible for reviewing the nursing unit's refrigerator. Which of the following drugs, if found inside the fridge, should be removed? A. Nadalil, Corgard. B. Opened, in use, Humulin N injection. C. Urokinase, Kinlytic. D. Epoetin Alpha IV, Epogen. Correct answer, A, Corgard. Rationale. Nadalil, Corgard, is stored at room temperature between 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 and 30 degrees Celsius, away from heat, moisture, and light. Do not store in the bathroom and keep the bottle tightly closed. Option B, humulin and injection if unopened, not in use, is stored in the fridge and can be used until the expiration date or stored at room temperature and used within 31 days. If opened in use, store the vial in a refrigerator or at room temperature and use within 31 days. Store the injection pen at room temperature, do not refrigerate, and use within 14 days. Keep it in its original container protected from heat and light. Do not draw insulin from a vial into a syringe until you are ready to give an injection. Do not freeze insulin or store it near the cooling element in a refrigerator. Throw away any insulin that has been frozen. Option C, urokinase, kinlytic, is refrigerated at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. 
Lyophilized urokinase, although stable at room temperature for three weeks, should be stored desiccated below minus 18 degrees Celsius. Upon reconstitution, urokinase should be stored at 4 degrees Celsius between 2 to 7 days and for future use below minus 18 degrees Celsius. Option D, epoetin alpha IV, epogen, vials should be stored at 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius, 36 degrees Fahrenheit to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not freeze. Do not shake. Protect from light. Number 21. A 34-year-old female has recently been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. She has also recently discovered that she is pregnant. Which of the following is the only immunoglobulin that will provide protection to the fetus in the womb? A. IgA B. IgD C. IgE D. IgG Correct answer, D, IgG. Rationale. IgG is the only immunoglobulin that can cross the placental barrier. About 70 to 80% of the immunoglobulins in the blood are IgG. Specific IgG antibodies are produced during an initial infection or other antigen exposure, rising a few weeks after it begins, then decreasing and stabilizing. The body retains a catalog of IgG antibodies that can be rapidly reproduced whenever exposed to the same antigen. IgG antibodies form the basis of long-term protection against microorganisms. Option A. IgA antibodies protect body surfaces that are exposed to outside foreign substances. Immunoglobulin A, IgA, is the first line of defense in the resistance against infection via inhibiting bacterial and viral adhesion to epithelial cells and by neutralization of bacterial toxins and virus, both extra and intracellularly. IgA also eliminates pathogens or antigens via an IgA-mediated excretory pathway where binding to IgA is followed by polyimmunoglobulin receptor-mediated transport of immune complexes. Option B. IgD antibodies are found in small amounts in the tissues that line the belly or chest. Secreted IgD appears to enhance mucosal homeostasis and immune surveillance by arming myeloid effector cells such as basophils and mast cells with IgD antibodies reactive against mucosal antigens, including commensal and pathogenic microbes. Option C. IgE antibodies cause the body to react against foreign substances such as pollen, spores, animal dander. IgE antibodies are found in the lungs, skin, and mucous membranes. They are involved in allergic reactions to milk, some medicines, and some poisons. Number 22. A second-year nursing student has just suffered a needle stick while working with a patient that is positive for AIDS. Which of the following is the most significant action that the nursing student should take? A. Immediately see a social worker. B. Start prophylactic azadothymidine treatment. C. Start prophylactic pentamidine treatment. D. Seek counseling. Correct answer. B. Start prophylactic azadothymidine treatment. Rationale. Azadothymidine treatment is the most critical intervention. It is an antiretroviral medication used to prevent and treat HIV AIDS by reducing the replication of the virus. Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV is a treatment to suppress the virus and prevent infection after exposure. Post-exposure prophylaxis should be taken within 72 hours of possible exposure to HIV, so it is important to seek treatment quickly. Option A, before reporting to a social worker, it is imperative to start a prophylaxis to reduce viral replication. Option C. Pentamidine is an antimicrobial medication given to prevent and treat pneumocystis pneumonia. Option D. It is natural to have strong emotions after an exposure to HIV in the workplace. The healthcare worker might feel anger, fear, blame, or depression. During the difficult time of prevention treatment and waiting, they may want to seek support. Try an employee assistance program 
or local mental health expert. Number 23. A 35-year-old male has been an insulin-dependent diabetic for five years and now is unable to urinate. Which of the following would you most likely suspect? A. Atherosclerosis. B. Diabetic nephropathy. C. Autonomic neuropathy. D. Somatic neuropathy. Correct answer. C. Autonomic neuropathy. Rationale. Autonomic neuropathy, also known as diabetic autonomic neuropathy, affects the autonomic nerves, which control the bladder, intestinal tract, and genitals, among other organs. Paralysis of the bladder is a common symptom of this type of neuropathy, as manifested by bladder urgency and inability to start urination. Option A, atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, is a condition in which plaque builds up inside the arteries. Plaque is made of cholesterol, fatty substances, cellular waste products, calcium, and fibrin, a clotting material in the blood. Option B, Diabetic nephropathy is typically defined by macroalbuminuria, that is, a urinary albumin excretion of more than 300 mg in a 24-hour collection, or macroalbuminuria, an abnormal renal function, as represented by an abnormality in serum creatinine, calculated creatinine clearance, or glomerular filtration rate. Clinically, diabetic nephropathy is characterized by a progressive increase in proteinuria, and an increased need to urinate. Option D. Somatic neuropathy affects the whole body and presents with diverse clinical pictures. Most common is the development of diabetic foot followed by diabetic ulceration and possible amputation. Number 24. You are taking the history of a 14-year-old girl who has a, a BMI of 18. The girl reports inability to eat, induced vomiting and severe constipation. Which of the following would you most likely suspect? A. Multiple sclerosis. B. Anorexia nervosa. C. Bulimia nervosa. D. Systemic sclerosis. Correct answer, B. Anorexia nervosa. Rationale. All of the clinical signs and symptoms point to a condition of anorexia nervosa. The key feature of anorexia nervosa is self-imposed starvation, resulting from a distorted body image and an intense, irrational fear of gaining weight, even when the patient is emaciated. Anorexia nervosa may include refusal to eat accompanied by compulsive exercising, self-induced vomiting, or laxative, or diuretic abuse. Option A. Multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease in which the insulating covers of the nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord are damaged. Option C. On the other hand, bulimia nervosa features binge eating followed by a feeling of guilt, humiliation, and self-deprecation. These feelings cause the patient to engage in self-induced vomiting, use of laxatives, or diuretics. Option D. Systemic sclerosis or systemic scleroderma is an autoimmune disease of the connective tissue. Number 25. Rogam is most often used to treat mothers that have a infant A. Rh positive, Rh positive B. Rh positive, Rh negative C. Rh negative, Rh positive D. Rh negative, Rh negative Correct answer, C, Rh negative, Rh positive. Rogan prevents the production of anti-Rh antibodies in the mother that has an Rh positive fetus. Option A, Rogam is a prescription medicine that is used to prevent Rh immunization, a condition in which an individual with Rh negative blood develops antibodies after exposure to Rh positive blood. Option B, if the father or baby is not conclusively shown to be Rh negative, Rogam should be given to an Rh negative mother in the following clinical situations to prevent Rh immunization. After delivery of an Rh positive baby, routine prevention of Rh immunization at 26 to 28 weeks of pregnancy, maternal or fetal bleeding during pregnancy from certain conditions, or an actual 
or threatened pregnancy loss at any stage. Option D. It isn't until second and subsequent pregnancies when antibodies are already built up that Rh incompatibility can cause problems. Indeed, these antibodies can cross the placenta and attack the baby's red blood cells. This can cause the baby to develop anemia and in severe cases, result in miscarriage. Good luck students and thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos.